Well, Dad was born in 1916 in Green Bay. The family had moved up there uh, just shortly before he was born. His father was working for the railroad and the opportunity came up. So they moved to Green Bay from Chicago. Dad was the sixth and final child. Uh, his older three sisters were pretty much out of the house by the time he came along. His, his mother died when he was six. So at that point, they moved back to Chicago and he grew up there, went to Hyde Park High. Uh, college, came, college time came around and a buddy said, I'm going to Alabama, how about you? And they drove down to University of Alabama and went to school. And he got into ROTC. This would have been 1935. He got into ROTC. And by 1939, when he graduated, he realized that being in the, there was a good call to be going through ROTC and he went into coastal artillery. Um, soon thereafter, he realized he wanted to fly. He wanted to fly, 39, 40, and he went to flight school, did not get through it, so he went to navigational school out on the West Coast. And that's where he was in 1941, in December of 41, and uh, throughout the winter. And Doolittle started planning the raid and realized he needed B-25s, and also realized the best trained crews were out there in Pendleton, out there in Washington. So he, he had them all sent to South Carolina and uh, he talked to them, told them it was uh, very dangerous. They'd be out of the country. It was top secret. Anyone could back out anytime they wanted to after they'd volunteered. They all stood up and said, let's go. And they went down to um, Fort Walton Beach and Eglin Field. And, in the panhandle, and trained for about mm, six six weeks or so. It was not it was not the most thorough of training. It just it couldn't be. But they did, excuse me, the pilots did understand they could take off in a short distance required off an aircraft carrier. And so they were ready. They went uh, flew across country to Alameda, got on the. Uh, Hornet, which was, this was its maiden cruise, and um, this, would have, this would have been um, on the 1st of April, 1942, and they took off, had a small task force, and met the larger task force with Bull Halsey out at sea a couple days later, and steamed on across the North Pacific. That's in a nutshell. Oh, I should back. He was a boxer too. He was a boxer in college. He had a pretty good career uh, until one day, uh, I think he was returning to the university, had a terrible wreck and broke both ankles. He was still in college. And the first thinking was he wasn't going to walk again properly. And uh, he said, well, to heck with that idea. And he got himself trained and he got in the pool and started swimming. He got all motility back. He was fine. Obviously, he wouldn't have he wouldn't have gone forward with his air career, so he was one tough nut. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about how they trained during that six week period. Sure. The um, the B twenty five bomber was probably the smallest and lightest weight. Still needed a lot more than about the four hundred four hundred fifty feet that an aircraft carrier could afford them. So Doolittle and others had to figure out how best, how best to get that engine revved up, where the flap should be, uh, and so forth, before they let off on the brakes. What was, what'd they have to do? They studied that. The pilots trusted Doolittle. <clears throat> um, as the world knew, he was an absolutely heroic aviator. The world, the nation knew him. And the men said, if he said we could do it, we'll do it. Um, there was o over the Gulf, you know, takeoff and landing, uh, some bomb runs, but not much, some navigational tests, but not much. The time wasn't there. Um, and really, it was sort of a hope and a prayer by the time they were ready to go. It was time to go. That was the window of opportunity to get across the Pacific, so they went. And of course, as you can guess, those guys, those pilots especially, were can-do. If you said, do it, and they said, sure, we'll do it. So, yeah. 
That was their training. So it's April 18th, 1942. Right. Talk me through what's happened. Well, they were about 650 nautical miles off the coast. The plan was to get a sail all that day and take off at night to be within maybe 400 miles off the coast. There were, uh, there was a line of, 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 um, of boats out about 600, 650 miles. They were spotted by one of these little skiffs. They were spotted and they realized they've got to go now. They've got to take off now. They've been discovered and obviously the message must have gotten back to the mainland. So while they were sinking that little boat and rescuing the crew, um, about eight in the morning, they were all mustered up to their planes and they were all aboard and Doolittle took off at eight o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> about, about 10 hours earlier than they had hoped. And it was about four minute interval between planes. So within about an hour, they were all off and gone. There was um, really no incident. Everybody got off fine. Everybody got off fine. Um, but they were four minutes apart. So there was no reconnoitering. There was no going in as a unit. Although their targets over Tokyo and Kobe and Osaka and so forth weren't really very far apart. They were all in the southern Japan area. Some pilots said they saw other pilots, but they did not form, were not in formation. Most of them hit their, hit their um, targets. Could not determine just how much damage was done. Uh, but they did hit their targets. The vast majority of them hit their targets. And then they, again, 15 out of 16 flew across the South China Sea, heading toward China. At that point, the plan was that Chiang Kai-shek's uh, people would have a, an airfield waiting for them outside of Japanese-held territory, and they would go there. That never materialized, never materialized. The 16th plane um, realized he was going to be too low on fuel to get across the sea to China. So he turned and went up to Vladivostok, Russia and made it there. Um, I can go into that story. It's not my dad's story, but those guys were held uh, not as prisoners, but as guests of the Soviet Union from, um, I think, about 18 months or longer. They were treated all right but they were interned. Um, Dad always maintained that uh, when the Navy guys allowed them into their poker games, they cleaned the Air Force guys out, and he said, we all took off flat broke. Not that we needed anything, but he said, I didn't win a dime. I was flat broke, and so was everybody else when we took off. So, yeah. So... Well, these 15 planes had vastly different experiences. Some of them had to put down or crash right at, at the shore. Uh, and two of, those, two of those crews were captured. Uh, another crew, of course, uh, Ted Lawson's crew, evaded capture. And of course, we know that story from his book, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, where he lost his leg, uh, had it had, uh, amputated. Dad's plane and others flew in uh, further inland. They got well into and, and even past the Japanese held territory before they ran out of fuel and bailed out. By this time, it's pitch dark and they're in one heck of a storm. One heck of a storm, pitch dark. They had no idea where they were. There was no navigation going on and they could not pick up any signal from Chiang Kai-shek's people, there were no signals to be had. They bailed out. They bailed out into the storm. Um, only one man of the, of the bailouts was lost. His chute apparently did not open. All the rest uh, made it. Got uh, some bunged up ankles and a bad shoulder and so forth, but they, those that all bailed out got away were out of the Japanese held territory or were brought out very quickly. 
and gotten together within a matter of days, matter of days. All right. Where, where did your dad land? Um, it was about 100 miles south of Po Young Lake. Po Young, I, I hope I'm close to the pronunciation, yeah. Having said that there was no navigation to go on, he always maintained that it was due to superior navigation that plane number nine got as far inland, further inland than any other plane. But um, that's still up for debate. Yeah. How did he meet up with the other uh, crew members? They all landed. Uh, they were probably no more than a half mile apart, but it took overnight. They were wandering this way and wandering that way, and they ran into each other. Or villagers would realize, hey, we've got another one of these guys down the road. Let's take him, let's take this guy to him, and so forth. Right. Uh, that's just how. His pilot, uh, Watson, they called him Doc, of course, uh, really bunged up his shoulder. He was never able to fly again. Badly bruised. So he was in a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort before they could get him out of there. They got him all together, then one crew got another crew, and... And, um, you know, there are pictures with a half dozen crews in Cujo at the so-called cave. And then there are pictures elsewhere with Dad's crew and most of the other crews all together there. Uh, I got them all together and they met Madame Chiang Kai-shek. And she awarded them Chinese Medal of Honor. Right. That was about the last official business before they were spirited on out over the hump to India those who left. There are some stayed behind, you know. Some stayed behind and worked on the resupply mission, the hump pilots and so forth. Most of them out through India, then on around the, on around the world to the States in May. Now, your, your, your dad's service didn't end. He didn't no. Take your road. No. Talk about post-raid. Post-raid. Um, <clears throat> during the summer, Thankfully, uh, high school buddies set him up on a blind date, and apparently they fell in love immediately. Uh, and then he was very soon, he went on a um, goodwill tour of factories and, and speaking engagements around the eastern states. And then he, they did some more training on, in the B-26 uh, in the states, and then flew via Greenland over to England uh, were there for a while before being fed down to Algeria uh, and, and the 8th Air Force under Doolittle again and uh, attacking Rommel's forces and, and the resupply to Rommel's out in the Med. He, uh, that was quite a time. That was quite a time. He, he, he lost one of his buddies, watched that plane go in, and his buddy, who was a navigator with the Doolittle raid, uh, did not make that. His plane went down a few days later. Pardon me, just said. Um, his, went down, his went down a few days later, and he said the pilot did an incredible job getting it in without losing the plane or us. They got out. The pilot, co pilot, were badly beat up, and uh, the five of them took about an hour to go about a half mile or three quarters of a mile into, into the shore of the Atlas Mountains. Coming down to the to the to the shore, I mean they got out of there. First Arabs, and then the French, and then the British got them back to medical attention for the pilot and co-pilot. Yeah. When you were growing up, what sense did you have that your your, your father had this you know, incredible story? Well, this is the truth. He would give us little bits and pieces of the story. And I told you about um, the card games on the, on the Hornet and how they lost their money and, and some other little funny stories. You would be forgiven if you thought that it must have been just a lark that Tom Griffin and the boys were just larking around the world from one funny little happenstance to the next. That's how he played it. That's how he talked about it. Um, it wasn't until my brother and I were young adults and we finally got around to picking up C.V. Glein's Histories of the Raid, and so forth, other, other books and so forth, and realized what all there was to it. So Dad, like most other veterans, didn't, didn't have much to say about their time. 
It took a long time. It took a long time until the 1990s before he and a lot of other vets started um, talking openly, started talking about what they'd been involved in. Just wasn't something that was done. You know that. They just didn't run their mouths off. Yeah. But of course, now the reunions were a different story. When they were together, and if you were listening, you could hear some tales. Only then, though. Only then. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got to ask him, was he a, a regular participant in the reunions? Um, well, the re first reunion was in Miami Beach, Florida, 19, uh, 1946. And they became regular soon thereafter, annual soon thereafter. I don't think he and mom went until my brother and I were in high school. He had too much to do. He had his own business. He couldn't get away. And so only, only by the early to mid 60s did he start going. And he was pretty much a regular after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Became something of a well-known lecturer. Yes. Um, yes. Talk about how you and he worked together on that. Oh, <laughs> I thank you for putting me. <laughs> I will. Um, somebody, it was a high school history teacher in Cincinnati where we lived, realized who Tom Griffin was, approached him for a couple of interviews, and put out some uh, articles in the local history quarterly. And that interest led to having dad work at the uh, History Museum as a docent for the World War II exhibit. And the next thing you know, all over the tri-state area, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, he was being called up by high schools, uh, rotary clubs, vets groups, you name it, come talk. Turns out he actually does, did do an excellent job of ordering his material, keeping to the chronology, not dropping facts, he had a wonderful self-deprecatory sense of humor, bring it in when they needed to, and um, do the whole thing like a polished speaker. He, um, he thought, he didn't understand why people were interested in him. And my brother and I would say, look, you're doing it. The other, the other raiders who shoot their mouths off don't do a particularly good job of keeping track of the, of the facts and keeping them in order, try as they might. You've got a knack, that's why. And so um, later on in my career, I had the opportunity to be able to go with him for some of the far out of town events. I could meet him and, and, or go take him there and whatnot. So I get to introduce him and just sort of uh, be his, uh, uh, you know, right hand man there, sort of a thing, make sure he got to where he needed to be. A lot of fun, a lot of fun. Why did you decide well, you know, that organization, you know, Melinda Liu and Jeff Thatcher and so forth. Uh, Jeff actually was instrumental in creating this organization, the Children of the Doolittle Raiders, to keep the, uh, the knowledge uh, of the Doolittle Raid alive and to maintain the scholarship and so forth. Um, Jeff had been over on his own to see where his dad was. His dad had been in um, Ted Lawson's plane. Found that they were very welcoming and people were very willing to help and take him around and so forth. And the next thing we knew, there were a couple of little museums being opened up to, the, uh, to honor the raid on Cujo and so forth. And he just said, we've got to do a trip. We've got to do an organizational trip. I'd been over with Dad in 2005, and I said, oh, heck, sign me up. The itinerary included a number of rather iconic places, the cave, the Lin High Clinic, where, the, where Ted Lawson had to be taken and met up with Doc White, who had to amputate. Uh, obviously, these museum openings, and we went to, oh, we went all over uh, Beijing. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it was a great itinerary. You couldn't miss it, couldn't miss it. Talk a little bit about your, your, the reception that you got from the, the Chinese people that you met. 
Well, I think I mentioned in an <clears throat> email earlier, I'm, I'm going to talk to first about the 2005 trip, where we honestly met far more um, citizens, Chinese citizens, uh, especially the younger ones. They were not at all as knowledgeable about the flying tigers, the hump pilots resupply, or the Doolittle raids. And this was all new history to them. And they were very overwhelmed when they would hear these stories. I was, it was wonderful to see. And the bus would go through towns and they would read what was going on, the big banner on the bus, and they would start applauding. So yeah, it was, we were uh, the talk, that we were the host, we were the, no, the toast of the town, wherever we went. They just really turned out in force and they couldn't get enough of those old guys. It was just tremendous, just tremendous. So it was hosted by the Department of Tourism and Education, I think is the name of the government organization that took care of this. And we went to the Flying Tiger Memorial. We went to the Hump Pilots Memorial. Yeah, they, they really did, a, did quite a, a wonderful job for us. It's, it's remarkable that you, you got that level of cooperation and, and you got that reception. Yep. At a time when uh, you know, the United States and China can't seem to agree on much of anything. Uh, I think Jeff and Melinda and the Bowers would agree wholeheartedly. They're all we've we've all been a bit um, overwhelmed and thankful that that was able to happen. We don't know if we'll be able to do it again anytime soon. Who knows when we'll get back on a or even keel with China's government. Oh. Yes. Is there something that uh, I should have asked that I didn't? Um, no, I, I really got a kick out of your questions because they were quite thorough. Um, and I think I mentioned, I'm doing a, a Shutterfly book on his career. And so I'm calling in stuff that I don't have from from other people, from my brother, from Jimmy Bauer and others. Hey, I need a such and such because it's got to be in there. This book's no good without it. And so it's been quite gratifying being able to uh, reread a lot of stuff and make certain I'm hitting all the high points in his career. Um, you and I are well aware of Tom Brokaw's uh, uh, greatest generation, right? Greatest generation. Um, that really was what got me and my brother started because we thought, shoot, his priest, dad's one of these guys. He kept his mouth closed. He had nothing to say. He didn't go over. He did not tell us the story. He did not. It was too, too much at that time through the 50s, 60s and so forth to go over. Just like Tom Brokaw said, they came home, went to work, started their careers and got on with their lives. So 